So as we begin our study in Malachi, and I would encourage people to be reading the book of Malachi over the coming uh, weeks. Uh, it's, it's not a, a big book, uh, so it's very manageable. Uh, even if you do half one day and half the next day and continuously read through it and become accustomed to it, it will definitely help in your understanding as we preach through this book. So uh, first, uh, let's have a word of context. One of, one of the big things that, that uh, I've learned uh, in my time uh, at college uh, to study and teach the Bible is that context is key. Understanding the word of God the way it was meant to be understood is massively important. And there's far too many people today claiming to be ministers of the word of God who fail in that solemn duty to make it clear to the people they're speaking to what the original author meant by it being written. So in that vein, let us uh, have a word about the context of Malachi. And it's interesting, it's helpful that we've been in Isaiah. See, we've been spending time in Isaiah of late, which takes place in the 8th century BC. The general thinking is that Isaiah's ministry was active from about 740s BC through certainly to around the 681 BC. Now, the reason I bring up Isaiah is because it's important that we remember that the Bible and its many books are historical. These are real people that are spoken about. And what we are given by Scripture is God's revelation of himself. God is showing us his unfolding plan of redemption. How he had chosen one man and his wife, how he had blessed them with a son, how he had guided, shaped, and grown this family into a nation. And then how from this nation would come the one who was promised. A king who would save his people from the consequences of sin, defeating death and ushering in a new and perfect kingdom where the people would enjoy a perfect, restored relationship with God for all eternity. Now, it's very easy to think, oh, that, you know, 800 BC or so, or 681 BC, that's so far ago, so far removed from us today. Why should I give it any thought? Well, simply speaking, if that, wasn't, if that didn't happen, we wouldn't be here today. You see, we are the fruits of the promise of the Old Testament. Because Christ is the fulfillment of the promise of the Old Testament. Have you ever read the Old Testament and struggled with it and thought, you know, you've, you've read the genealogies and it goes on and on and, you know, as hard as the names are, but you think to yourself, why, why bother? Surely, you know, chapter one, when it's all the genealogies in a, in a certain book, maybe I'll just go to chapter two. Why do I need to know these names? What, what's the point of the genealogies? Well, that's what I said for a long time. <laughs> uh, until I realized why the authors put them there. I realized how important they are and what the purpose is. And then I became excited by the genealogies. You see, because the genealogies is a way for God's people to look, to look for this promised king, this Messiah that was promised, a way back, not even a way back at Abraham, but a way back to the garden in Genesis 3.15, this serpent crusher that was promised. You know, we failed as a species, as a, as a race, Adam's race failed and fell because Adam refused to be the serpent crusher. You know, as soon as, as, soon as that serpent spoke to Eve, as soon as uh, it tried to seduce Eve and his sin, Adam should have just stepped on it. He should have been the serpent crusher. But he refused to protect his wife. He failed God. And in doing so, he turned away from God and fell into sin and took the creation with him. And then God done something miraculous. He promised to save these rebellious creatures. 
in Genesis 3.15, he promised the serpent crusher. And then he would give a little bit more information at different points in history to the next generations. So then they knew it would come through Abraham's family. Yeah? And then Isaac would be the son of promise, not Ishmael. So it would come through Isaac and not Ishmael. And then move further forward to the patriarchs. It was Jacob and not Esau that was chosen. And then you move forward again and you find it, 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 this, this promised Messiah would come through the tribe of Judah. And then you move forward again and you, you see King David on the throne and you say, you'll be from his line. It'll be the Davidic king. Well, just from what I've said there, do you understand the, the genealogies? They were on the lookout. How, how do you keep uh, a record of your search when you're probably not going to be alive to finish the search? Well, you, you're right and you pass it to the next generation. So the genealogies is a, has a detailed search for this king, this Messiah that was promised. Within the narrative of history, we see many ups and downs and twists and turns, and really how it impacts upon God's people. If anybody ever tells you that becoming a Christian will see your life suddenly uh, all come together and, and, and everything will be great. Yeah, uh, they're, they're lying to you, for one. Uh, it's never been that way for God's people. And for large parts of it, it's because we bring it in ourselves. Uh, but we live in a fallen world. And it's worth remembering that. So, History uh, has seen many ups and downs and twists and turns for God's people. Now, in Isaiah, uh, Isaiah was from a time when Israel was north and south, the north being Israel and the south being Judah. Um, it was in decline. They had been at the pinnacle of their power and prestige, first under the kingship of David, and certainly during the reign of David's son, King Solomon. But the rot that brought about the decline began in the reign of Solomon. When they were at their greatest, that's when things started to turn. And you often find that in our own lives. When things are going well, that's when the rot starts to set in. It's only when things are really bad that we notice. But that wasn't when it first started. So this decline began in the reign of Solomon and then carried on with a few high points here and there. But these were exceptions not the usual. Uh, the one united kingdom under David and Solomon had divided into the two kingdoms. You see the ten tribes in the north, known as Israel, and the two tribes in the south, known as Judah. This was the reality in which Isaiah ministered in, and his message was of a time when God was going to bring judgment on his people by using the nations around them. who would invade and remove the Israelites from the promised land that God gave to them. Remember, God's covenant with Israel was that they could keep the land so long as they kept his commandments. They had to keep their end of the covenant, covenant agreement. The one thing we should be thankful for today is we don't have the same conditions set upon us. The covenant that the Lord has with us today is not conditional upon us, but wholly upon Christ and what he had achieved in the cross. So if you're thinking here today, uh, oh, I, I go to church, I read my Bible, I pray, all good things. But if you think that that's a work towards your salvation today, then you need to understand the gospel of the Lord Jesus. We are not good people. And nothing we do will ever make us good enough for God. You see, God doesn't look at us or doesn't look at anything and think, oh, you know, that's good, that's great, that's amazing, that's bad, not great, even worse, evil. 
For God, there is good and there is evil. There's him and there's everything opposed to him. And for God, goodness is perfection. Now, I don't know about anybody else here today. I don't meet that standard of perfection. There is only one who ever did, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. So if if you're sitting here today relying on anything other than Jesus and his perfect life, his sinless perfection, and his atoning sacrifice to see you enter the kingdom of God, then you're in a very dangerous place. In order to be saved, you must repent and believe the gospel. Repent and trust in Jesus and in him alone. Israel failed to keep their covenant agreement. And as such, God would expel them from the land. And he would use the pagan nations and empires around them to do this. Do you ever think why uh, all these bad influences, all these, all these uh, wicked people seem to be able to bring about issues for God's people, for the church? Why would God allow it? I, th- I think Israel was thinking the same thing. I think they were sitting there thinking, well, we are God's people. Why would God allow the pagan nations to do what they're doing? Not understanding that God brings judgment even upon his people. The difference between God's judgment in his people and God's judgment on the world is that they'd be under condemnation. God judges his people to chastise them, to correct their behavior. When God judges the world to reject them, it will be an eternal judgment and an eternal rejection. But Israel had failed to hold up their end of the bargain. The pagan nations were coming. The surrounding empires were closing in. And in time, both kingdoms would be invaded. And this is in the time of Isaiah. We hear Isaiah talking about this thing happening in the future. The people would be taken into captivity, first by the Assyrians, then the Babylonians, and also by the Persian Empire. And the once great nation of Israel, a jewel of the ancient Near East, which accepted gifts and tributes from other kings in the time of Solomon, would be left in ruins with its people captive to foreign kings. This is the near future that Isaiah was warning of, a time of calamity for God's people, because in their disregard for God and his ways, they invited the just judgment of God upon themselves. But Isaiah didn't leave the people in complete despair, because although judgment would come, hope continues to play its important and much-needed role. And that hope is that through this judgment, God will save. God has always saved through judgment. What do you think the cross was? Just because you didn't bear the brunt of the judgment didn't mean that you're not saved by it. He will bring back a remnant from captivity and he will enter the land again. And ultimately that promised Messiah the one who through the shedding of his innocent blood and the giving of his unblemished body as a sacrifice would bring ultimate and eternal redemption. As we turn our attention to the time of Malachi now, we see a new installment in this good news story. And that's what the Bible is. It's one complete story, good news story. Or as we tell the kids, Bible truth. The exile and the captivity has come and gone in the time of Malachi. So the Assyrians came, uh, the Babylonians, the Persians, all happened. And in the time of Malachi, the exile and captivity has come and gone, and a remnant of the Jews have returned to Jerusalem. In fact, at the time of Malachi, it has been roughly 100 years 
since the Persian emperor Cyrus the Great had issued his decree to send the Jews back to Jerusalem to rebuild. So the reason that I'm explaining this, I'm going into such detail, is because I want you and I to get into the mindset of the Jews. The Jews in the time of Malachi have so turned away from God and for the most part, anybody who's even bothering to keep up appearances are just doing that. And maybe that's you here today. Maybe you're, you're coming to church because well, that's what you're supposed to do. Maybe you're not coming to church because your heart cries out to be with God's people and praise and sing and glorify his name. And I want to tell you that while that's not great, it has been something that's happened to God's people a time and time again. And there is a way through it. And that way is God. So the Jews were sent to rebuild Jerusalem. And you may be forgiven for thinking that this was a real positive thing. A century of return and rebuilding. God's people in God's place under God's blessing. And there were positives in this time, to be sure. But if you read through this part of their history, you can't help but understand where the sadness of the Jews came from. And this is important, because I really want us to try and understand the mindset of the people. They were once an independent nation with great riches. A united kingdom with power and prestige. They had a capital city at the center of which stood the great temple of Yahweh, the God of Israel. The temple was built by Solomon, and at its completion, the glory of the Lord rushed in and filled the temple. The Shekinah glory was above the temple waiting, and when it was dedicated, the Lord's presence rushed in. Can you imagine seeing that sight at the center of your capital city? It was a clear sign that God was present with his people. Such a high point. And then in the captivity, everything was destroyed. And God allowed even his temple and all its treasures within to be looted. That great city on Mount Zion had been reduced to ruin and a scarce population left behind. The message was clear. God, in response to breaking, the breaking of his covenant, had cast his people out from his presence. It was Eden-like. Just as God's people, Adam and Eve, had broken the covenant with God and been cast out from his presence, so too now had Israel. And if there were any doubt of this among the Jews, then certainly the sight of the temple of God being looted and destroyed would be enough to clear things up for them. God had removed his presence and his people have been removed from the land. All that time and effort they put into getting there and now they found themselves back where they started, outside the promised land and under bondage and in captivity. You see, the people of Israel had gone from slavery and captivity in Egypt to freedom in the Exodus and taking of the promised land and the building of their nation to the heights of David and Solomon. And then from Solomon to the exile and captivity, they had went from great heights to unimaginable lows. They were once again captives, enslaved to Assyria, then to Babylon, and then to the Persians. And even when Cyrus the Great, the emperor of Persia, looked favorably upon them because God had given them favor in his eyes and allowed them to return to the land, they were still no longer a self-governing independent nation. They no longer had a king of their own. They were a province of the Persian Empire. They returned to the land that wasn't that what uh, they returned to the land that wasn't what it was. And although they rebuilt the temple of the Lord, that wasn't what it was either. It just wasn't the same. The original temple, when it was completed, saw the glory of the Lord, which had been above the temple, descend and fill it. 
And there was absolute certainly, certainty that Yahweh dwelt among his people. God was in residence with them. This wasn't the case when the temple was rebuilt after the exile. There was no filling of the temple with the Shekinah glory. Israel no longer had the Ark of the Covenant. And at the dedication of the first temple, the altar was actually lit from fire from heaven. In this temple, none of that happened. In fact, in Ezra chapter 3, verses 12 and 13, it says this. And this is at the dedication of the new temple. But many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid. While many others shouted for joy, no one could distinguish the sound of the shouts of joy from the sound of weeping because the people made so much noise and the sound was heard far away. You see the distinction between the generations there? The people who had an understanding and a remembrance of what had come before, they had just seen this temple built and their reaction was to weep. While around them, the younger people were shouting for joy because they didn't understand what they'd lost. The reaction of those who remember past glories saw them weep due to their disappointment at the current temple. So that's that's the background to the situation in Malachi's time. In Malachi's time, the people are struggling. They're struggling because things aren't how they thought they would be. Life just doesn't match their expectations. And instead of asking why and doing some soul searching, they've done what is easy. And what most of us usually do, they blame God. They question God. In Malachi chapter 1, verses 1 to 5, which is our passage today, it says this. A prophecy, the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord. But you ask, how have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. I have turned his whole country into a wasteland and left his inheritance to the desert jackals. Edom may say, Edom is uh, the descendants of Esau, Edom may say, though we have been crushed, we will rebuild the ruins. But this is what the Lord Almighty says. They may build, but I will demolish. They will be called the wicked land a people always under the wrath of the Lord. You will see it with your own eyes and say, great is the Lord, even beyond the borders of Israel. We're going to look at three uh, points today. We're going to look at the reality of the Lord's love, the rejection of the Lord's love, and the restatement of the Lord's love. So point one is the reality of the Lord's love. How has the Lord demonstrated his love for Israel in the past? Because obviously these people don't recognize it. They're questioning it. God says, I have loved you. And they say, well, how have you loved us? Have you ever been in that situation? Maybe you've, maybe you've been in the role uh, like God finds himself in. Maybe you've been a parent and you try and convince your child that you love them, uh, and the things you've done for them is because you've loved them, and they say, well, how have you loved us? Maybe a more modern uh, version would be, well, what have you done for me lately? I know you did all that then, but, you know, now's now. Or maybe you have been on the other side, where you have failed to acknowledge the blessings and gifts and the help and the nurturing and the love of a parent because in the circumstances you find yourself in that moment things are so hard that you if it's no helping you now then it's what use is it 
Well, that's the question here. The question is, how has the Lord demonstrated his love for Israel in the past? And there's a few Bible verses or Bible passages to, that you can look at. But really, you can literally look throughout the Old Testament. Genesis 12, Exodus chapter 2, 30, Exodus chapter 34, Deuteronomy chapter 4 and chapter 7, and Jeremiah 31, 3. And just for an idea of what these verses contain, he chose Abraham, he promised a land for him and his descendants, he promised to make him great, a great nation through his descendants, and he fulfilled that promise. It's one of the ways the Lord showed his love to Israel. The Lord promised to bless Abraham and make his name great. He gave him Abraham favor in the eyes of many, and he protected Abraham and his wife from Pharaoh when they went into Egypt. He protected Sarah's virtue, knowing that she would be the bearer of the son of promise, Isaac. If Abraham continued in his lies when he went into Egypt and Pharaoh lay with Sarah, how could that have maybe wrecked the future of Israel and therefore the future redemption of mankind? But God stepped in. When Israel was in bondage in Egypt, the Lord heard the cry of his people. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the Lord acted out of love for his chosen people. The word remember here isn't that God somehow lacked knowledge or forgot. But at that moment in history, at that moment in time, that's when he chose to act. And that's what the word remember means in this situation. Exodus 34, 6 says, And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Well, Moses knew how great the Lord was. Moses knew that he was compassionate and gracious. And I bet he was very pleased that he was slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Because you see throughout history, people have let God down, not the other way around. And then in Deuteronomy, you see, uh, what other nation is so great as to have their gods near them the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray to him? This is the people of Israel speaking. And what other nation is so great as to have such righteous decrees and laws as this body of laws I am setting before you today? This was a time when God's people knew that God loved them. Jeremiah 30, 31, 3, the Lord is faithful and loves his people with an everlasting love. How quickly the generations forget. Then we can ask ourselves, well, how has the Lord demonstrated his love to his people today? Because let's not pretend that it's only ancient Israel that had issues, that the church doesn't face the same issues today. That in the midst of suffering and pain and and hard times that that question doesn't pop into our heads at times but do you really love me Lord how have you loved me well in 1 John 4 9 to 10 it says this this is how God showed his love among us he sent his one and only son into the world that we may live through him this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Can you imagine the type of love it takes to be willing to send your child to sacrifice himself for a world that rejects you? For a world that hates you? For a world that refuses to acknowledge you. And this world that you created. Most of us would, would struggle to say uh, to sacrifice ourselves for others. And we like to think that when the time comes, we'll be the hero and step in. But the truth is we don't really know 
until that time arrives. In the Bible, we like to look at the characters and imagine ourselves in those roles. We like to think of ourselves as the hero. But in the Bible, man isn't the hero. Jesus Christ is. Man is the people who need saving, who are trapped. Trapped by their own sin. But the Lord showed his love for us and that he gave his one and only son. He loved you. That You were that important to him. If you're sitting here today, born again, saved, believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, forgiven and redeemed, the Lord our God, the creator of the heavens and earth, loved you so much that while you hated him and turned away from him and spat in his face, he gave his son for you. What does that knowledge and understanding create in you today? It should create in us a thankfulness. One of my favorite uh, hymns is How Deep the Father's Love for Us. But we sing that almost flippantly because we really don't understand how deep the Father's love is for us. Not really. We have a, a, a surface understanding of it. And maybe we can get a little deeper in the most difficult, hard moments when that reality shines through, that God loves us. God wants us to, to be in relationship with him. One of the things that's important about the Lord's table is it, it should remind us of that. And although we're, we're not having communion this morning, but we have it nearly every week. And the danger is it becomes a ritual. The danger is that you sit here uh, in your seats and you or David or myself or Rod bring the bread and bring the, the cup to you. And you just take it. You just take it. You hear us uh, speak uh, and talk about what the table means. But it's by that point, it's ten past, quarter past twelve. And you've been here sitting, listening and singing for an hour. And you're paying a little less attention as the minutes go by. So you sit there and you take the cup and you take the bread because that's what you do. When it's offered to you, if you're a Christian, you take the bread and you take the cup. But it's supposed to turn our attention to Christ. It's a time to deal with any sin that's, that's harming your relationship with Christ, that's harming your relationship with other Christians. You're supposed to be reflective And then you're really we're really all supposed to ask the question, should I really take this this week? If you don't ask the question, if you just take it, it's a ritual. And it loses all meaning. And in fact, as uh, Corinthians speaks, you're, you're dishonoring the table. You're taking something that Christ gave us in order to help us uh, give ourselves a heart check and you're just disregarding that. So the danger is that, that we fall into ritual, like the people in Malachi's time, and you just you come to church and you take communion and you, you do the things you're supposed to do, do the things a good Christian does. Whereas deep inside, there's an attitude. And the attitude issue is what God really cares about. Because we wouldn't be doing the wrong things if our attitude was right. So we turn our attention to the second point. The first point was the reality of the Lord's love. 
Second point, the rejection of the law's love. Why are Israel's uh, doubts about or rejection of God's love such a scandal? Well, again, I just believe that if you can go to the scriptures for answers, that's where you go. Now, I can sit up here and I can spend hours writing and coming up with nice, eloquent words to uh, say to you today. But I would, I would rather let the scriptures speak. So, turn our attention to Psalm, uh, Psalms 145, verses 3 and 5, which says, Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell, you, they tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. And I will meditate on your wonderful works. This was written, time of David, time of Solomon. We're now over 500, roughly about 500 years later. Uh, in time of Malachi. And the scriptures tell us that one generation commends the works of the Lord to another. They tell of his mighty acts. They speak of his glorious splendor and of his majesty. And they actually meditate upon his works. Well, that maybe gives us an insight to why the fact that they're rejecting the Lord in this way is such a scandal. In Malachi chapter 2, verses 17 and 3, 14, it says, you have wearied the Lord with your words. They replied, how have we wearied him? By saying, all who do evil are good in the eyes of the Lord, and he is pleased with them. Or where is the God of justice? You have said it is futile to serve God. What do we gain by carrying out his requirements and going about like mourners before the Lord Almighty? You know, the rejection of the Lord's love doesn't usually start with a complete and utter hostile rejection. We just stop putting effort into the relationship. It becomes a little less important and other things start to take, it, take the place. There's a reason that the first commandment is about the Lord your God. The reason the first commandment is to have no other idols, to have no other gods before him. Because we continuously can... And, uh, Right through history and in our own lives today, we continuously create for ourselves idols because human beings were created to worship. And, when, and the question isn't whether or not I worship the Lord or not. The question is who do I worship? Because that, that's the only question. There is no one alive today, no, no human being in history who has ever not worshipped. You either worship the true and living God or you worship something else. Could be your job. Could be children. Not that it's bad to love your kids, but it's wrong to worship them. Could be wives or husbands. Could be that you're so house proud that you spend hours on your knees cleaning the floor and making sure it looks amazing in case any visitors come but your Bible sits on the shelf cut, create, uh, getting dust on it. In fact, the outside might be really clean because you've cleaned the outside, but you've not opened the inside. We remove God from different parts of our lives. And it's usually in increments. This is a hundred years from when the Jews returned. couple of hundred years or so from uh, the start of the exile. And when they first came back, when they first built that temple, even the people who wept, they still had a fire for the Lord. The young people were on fire for the Lord. They just wanted to worship. That's the thought process. But we, we're back in God's, God's land under God's uh, kingship. 
and his presence is going to return. And we just get we just get to worship him every day. And yet us today have that opportunity with very little, with very little persecution or opposition. And we find other things to do. Is our attitude today like them then? Saying it is futile to serve God? What do we gain by carrying out his requirements? Well, I would ask the question, what does it matter if we gain nothing? Because the Lord has already elected us and saved us, created us and sustains us. And if he gave us nothing else, is, that, is he not worthy in himself of worship and praise and service? What do you do for God? What do you do in response to the Lord's love? And do you think of it as, well, okay, if I do that, then I can have all this free time for myself? Or is your thought process, how much can I do for God? Or is it, how much do I need to do? So it looks all right. The third point, and last point, is the restatement of the Lord's love. The Lord's love makes a massive difference. Now, people can uh, listen to this uh, passage in Malachi when he says that, you know, he's, the Lord has loved Jacob but hated Esau. And the Lord makes it clear that it has nothing to do with Jacob and Esau. God just chose to love Jacob and hate Esau. Sounds very harsh. Especially when you think of them as little babies. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's bad enough for Esau that his name means hairy. Uh, now he gets in scripture it's the Lord saying, I hate him. But asking a very simple question about any part of scripture is important, and that is, what does it mean? And when you, when you look at the word hated here, you need to ask, well, what does, what does the author mean by the word hated? Because words change and meanings change through the centuries and context is key. Well, simply put, when God says that he loved uh, Jacob and, and hated Esau, he's, he's talking about an elective love, a, cho- a choosing. That to choose one over the other is to love one and not the other. But not that he didn't have a general love. God is love and God loves people. He doesn't condone the behaviors. That's a different thing. And again, it's that word love getting taken out of context that you find everywhere. People say God is love, therefore anything that I do, God loves me. Therefore, to, to, you must accept me, you must uh, be okay with my choices. And, and the Lord says, no. I showed my love for you and I sent my son to die for you. What about you showing your love for him by being obedient, by seeking to be transformed and change and in the very image of his son. Not use the character of God as an excuse to have sin. Again, people in Malachi's time said that. All who do evil are good in the eyes of the Lord and he is pleased with them. No, it's just not true. The Lord has a standard for moral righteousness. And we as creatures don't get to determine what that is. He gives it to us. God isn't good because he does good things. Something is good because God does it. He is the margin. He's he's the... He, he's the definition of goodness. Which is why to understand whether we're doing right or wrong in his eyes is when we match up to him or we move away from him. Uh, 
God doesn't need to meet, meet our standards of, of righteousness and goodness. So the law's love makes a difference. It's the fact that he loved Jacob meant, in this context, he, did, he didn't love uh, Esau because he didn't choose him. And then Edom, uh, the kingdom of Edom was the descendants of Esau, just as the Israel was the descendants of Jacob. So the law's love does another thing. It exposes wickedness and it exposed the wickedness of Edom. In Numbers 20, Moses sent messengers from Kadesh to the king of Edom, saying, this is what your brother Israel says. You know about all the hardships that have come in us. Our ancestors went down into Egypt and we lived there many years. The Egyptians mistreated us and our ancestors, but when we cried out to the Lord, he heard their cry and sent an angel and brought us out of Egypt. Now we are here at Kadesh, a town of the edge of the territory. Please let us pass through your country. We will not go through any field or vineyard or drink water from any well. We will travel along the king's highway and not turn to the right or the left until we have passed through your territory. But Edom answered, you may not pass through here. If you try, we will march out and attack you with the sword. Then the Israelites replied, we will go along the main road and if we or livestock drink any of your water, we'll pay for it. We only want to pass through on foot, nothing else. Again, Edom answered, you may not pass through. Then Edom came out against them with a large and powerful army. And since Edom refused to let them go through their territory, Israel turned away from them. This was the descendants of brothers. And the impact of the Lord's love in Israel, you see how they approached their, their brother. And the impact of Esau not having the Lord's love. How did Edom treat her brother? See, we can sit here and say, oh, well, yeah, we're Christians and I love the Lord, but then go and treat the Lord's people in such a poor way. In fact, not just refusing to get involved, but actively going against What we do matters. It doesn't earn us salvation, but it shows us salvation. Prove you're a Christian. Prove you're saved. Prove you have the Holy Spirit within you. Well, you, the Bible tells us the answer to that as well. You say, well, the fruits, look at the fruits of my life. Can you tell by the fruits of my life that I am a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, that I've been saved and redeemed and I receive his Holy Spirit as a uh, guarantee of my inheritance? And that I'm being shaped and molded and formed into the very image of Christ. Do you see me trying to live a life for the Lord? Not always succeeding. But do you see that I try? That I have a sincere heart for it? What we do matters. So the Lord brought a judgment in Edom. Saul and uh, 1 Samuel had assumed the rule over Israel. He fought against their enemies on every side. And it mentions the Moabs, the Ammonites, Edom, the kings of Zobah and the Philistines. Wherever he turned, he inflicted punishment on them. Punishment's an interesting word, I thought, in that text. He could have said that he defeated them or routed them or destroyed them. But the word is punished. Is it worth thinking that perhaps this was the Lord's work in through his people because of the sin of the Moabites, the Ammonites and the Edomites and the Philistines and the Zobah? The Lord brought judgment and it is right, it's his right to do so. We see the difference that the Lord says no matter how long they rebuild, no matter how much effort they put in, Edom is done. His judgment upon Edom is forever. But that's not 
true for Israel, and it's not true for us today. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, the Lord shows that he, love, he loves and forgives his people. It says this, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. In Matthew 25, 31 and 46, it shows a forgiven people. And it says, you know, it's the sheep and the goats parable. And I won't read it right through because we're running close in time. But basically, it's saying a forgiven people will show their position in Christ by how they treat one another. By your attitudes. You know, the Lord says in, in, in that, uh, the sheep and goats passage, he says, how, how you treat the least of mine is important. It shows where you're at. It shows whether you belong to him. When uh, Saul was on the road to Damascus before he got saved, um, and he'd been persecuting the church, persecuting Christians left, right, center, wherever he could find them, he was routing them out. And he was doing it, thinking he was doing it in the name of the Lord. And he met the risen Christ on the road to Damascus, who appeared before him. And Paul cried out, who are you, Lord? And Jesus says, I am Jesus, whom you have persecuted. Jesus had, been, had risen and been uh, ascended to heaven by this point. How was he persecuting Jesus? Because he was persecuting his people. And how, biblically, how it's supposed to work is when you attack the people, you attack the king. And you invite the wrath of the king and the judgment of the king. But the Lord is merciful to those he has chosen before the foundations of the earth in the sense that he draws them to himself. So instead of bringing complete and utter judgment upon Saul, who became Paul, he saved them and used them to his glory. How great is the Lord? He can take an enemy, conquer him, and use him. So, a question to leave on is, a why, are the peop why are the people doubting God's love? And how are we similar? Whether we actually say the words, Lord, how have you loved us? Is, how is, the, is there an attitude that's manifesting in our lives that says that? It's easy to get into that position. And I think one of the main reasons, and I think it's, it's evident in Malachi, is that it's about God's promises versus our experience. God's promises are true. They're real. You can bet your life on it, although I'm not encouraging people to gamble, but you can stand upon it. The promises of God are true they don't always happen when we want them to happen. You don't always see the benefit of it, even in our lifetime. So our experience doesn't really match up with the reality of God's promises at times. And when you find yourself out of sync with God's promises, it becomes very easy to question the love of God. And for your attitude to grow and for you to find yourself in a position where you, you no longer seek to serve him. You no longer seek to worship him. You forsake any bonds of faithfulness or, or fellowship. And you do your own thing. And you, yeah, if you still want to 
be called a Christian, you'll fit in some ritual here and there. But it doesn't come for the heart. This is the situation that Malachi is dealing with. This is where the people are at in Malachi's time. The people who witnessed the Exodus and the generations close to that, they saw God's promises being fulfilled like that. It's not hard, although they did make it hard, it's not hard to, to uh, believe and glorify God when you see uh, the presence of the Lord on the mountain. When you just get to look at it and know he's there. And when you know that he's brought you out of Egypt. It's not hard when you see the glory of the Lord above the new temple and then suddenly he fills it. And your whole lives, your whole daily lives are surrounding the throne of God in your presence. And it's about you coming to worship. The daily life's all about worship. For the Christian, it is all about worship. Whether you're going to work, you go to work and you serve and you worship the Lord. Which means you don't put in just what you need to. You go above and beyond. If you see somebody in need and you can help, you do it. Why? Because the Lord first loved us when we didn't deserve it, when we'd done nothing. So why do you need to have a reason to be loving and helpful to somebody else? Doubting of God's love, I think, is a lot about God's promises and our experience. Which is why the, the word of God is so helpful. The word of God reminds us of past generations. Of what the Lord has done for us. Let's pray. Father God, we, Lord, we praise you, we worship you, we love you, but Lord, we fail you. And Lord, you are are just and holy. But Father, we pray and ask for your help. Help us in our struggles. Not to, not to try and gain salvation because we can't, but that we may reflect you, that we may show how you love us by how we respond to that love. And Lord, that others would be drawn to that light. And that this church here, the people here, would be a beacon unto our community. We long to see more people saved, Lord. More people move from darkness to light, from death to life. But Lord, we as a people need to be right with you. Your church cannot and must not just be about ritual. It needs to be real. And our worship can't just fit into convenient times but it has to be a whole life worship. So Lord, forgive us and help us and sustain us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.